Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have you join with us online. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. My name is David Dixon. I'm the pastor of New Life Church Crawley, and I, I welcome you on behalf of the, the leaders and members of the church. I'm going to take a moment to pray before we turn to God's word together. Let's do that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement, the comfort, and even the challenge it brings into our lives. I pray that you give us real insight and understanding today that we could not only know what it says, but apply it to our own lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, to say that 2020 is an interesting year would be a spectacular understatement. We know that the world all over is facing this pandemic and we're still currently in the middle of it and approaching the end of June 2020. There's been racism, there's been social unrest, there's been riots, there's been all sorts of worldwide events that have dominated the media in a very negative way. And I think one of the key words that we have to get to grips with is, is that we live in a time of disruption. And many people have expressed the sentiment, well, I can't wait that things get back to normal. And I think that's a laudable sentiment. It's something many people wish for. But actually, I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon. And so, and so I think there's some adjustments that we have to make. I think there's some things that we have to learn because not only does it look as if it's socially going to be like this for a while, but I think God has a purpose in this as well. In fact, the title of today's message, both part one and part two, is Divine Disruption. Because I think that's what's happening in our world. I I think what we're experiencing is a divine disruption. Let me read to you from God's word because I think that'll give us some help and some framework to understand what I'm wanting to say to us today. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll be picking to read up a verse 25. Don't worry if you don't have a Bible, the verses will come on screen for you in a second. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who's speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will not only shake the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe. I believe in my bones that one of the things God is saying to us at the moment is that we are in a time of divine disruption That God is wanting us to readjust and recalibrate and and get a new focus on him. And truthfully, I think this has been the pattern of God working in history. When you go back to some of the main Bible characters, you think of Joseph, who got this incredible dream and revelation that God was going to raise him to an exalted place in the nation and his brothers would bow down to him. But he, he faces this divine disruption in a dream and he tells his brothers and his, he ends up in slavery and it's not till towards the end of his life where he's reconciled with his brothers that he makes a startling conclusion. He said, though you intended it for evil, God intended it for good. The divine dis- disruption that God brought into Joseph's life was uncomfortable for him and led him in, in a dark path and many seasons of his life, but he knew it was God. It was a divine disruption. We think of someone like Moses, the story of the burning bush in Exodus chapter three. He was happy in the backside of the wilderness, tending the sheep, and then he sees 
this burning bush and he goes to investigate and he has this incredible encounter with God and God says, do you know what Moses, I'm, I'm sending you back to the biggest superpower of the day and you have to go and tell the Pharaoh that he has to let my people go. And understandably, this divine disruption was not welcome in Moses' life. He had had experience of Pharaoh and he begins to make his excuses. He says, I can't speak. I I can't say anything. Send my brother Aaron. And and God has to challenge him. Eventually sends sends him and, and sends people around him to help him. Divine disruption in Moses' life. And what about Gideon? The enemies of God's people were oppressing them and Gideon was hiding in the wine press, making wine and he has this angelic encounter with God. And God says to him, you're a great and mighty warrior and I want you to go and fight the battle. And and, and Gideon kind of looks around and says, but I'm the weakest in my clan and my clan is the weakest clan. How can I possibly go? I'm not going to listen to this disruption in my life. But God used him to defeat the enemy with only a small army. Divine disruption in Joseph's life. Divine disruption in Moses' life. Divine disruption in Gideon's life. And and what about Jonah? It's one of the stories that many people learn in their childhood. And the story of the great fish. But if you look at Jonah chapter 1, God comes and says to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, there's no way I'm going there. The the Ninevites had had a fierce reputation. They were very cruel to their enemies. And Jonah, understandably, is reluctant to go. And not only is he reluctant to go, he, he decides not only to disobey God, but to go in the opposite direction to a place called Tarshish. That's where he headed for. It was, it was kind of like the, the, the Mecca of the day. It was kind of the Hollywood of the day. It was the place where people aspire to go to. It's the place that people wanted to live, wherever that place is for you. It was a great for trade. And this divine disruption in Jonah's life was certainly not welcome. What about David? He wrote our most famous psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He was out tending the sheep one day and the family forgot about him because the great prophet had come to anoint a new king. And David was the litter and the runt of the family and they forgot about him and Samuel couldn't find any of the brothers that were suitable. And he says, is, is there anyone else? And they said, oh yeah, there's little David. He's out in the fields, but he'll, he doesn't amount to anything. And the prophet instructs that he's called in and, and David is anointed king over Israel. But it's 14 years before he's really getting to that place of rising. And in that in-between time, he has to live with this divine disruption in his life. He has to live with this process of being uncomfortable, knowing he's called, knowing God has a purpose for our life, his life, but actually working his way through the process of getting to that place. What about Peter? Peter is the disciple many people love because he, he's like us, he, he makes his mistakes, he gets it wrong, he seems to fail quite a lot. And in one of those occasions, Jesus, after his resurrection, has to restore Peter to active service and he makes them breakfast. And, and Peter is kind of wondering about some of the other disciples and says, well, well, what about him? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus has to say to him, Peter, there's going to be a div- divine disruption in your life. Because later in your life, you're going to be led to a place where you don't want to go. You're going to be led in a way that's uncomfortable for you. That's not a direction that you would wish to go. And you're going to be blindly led. History suggests to us that that Peter was led to his death and was crucified upside down. You see, all of those people had a divine disruption in their life and had to work through the discomfort, had to work through the process, had to understand that God doesn't work according to our ways and he comes and sometimes he will shake things up in our life. What's his purpose? So that what remains is what cannot be shaken. 
Because we need that eternal perspective. We need that different perspective because we get caught up in certain things. And today, I want to preach a message to you that's a message of transformation, not simply information. In part two of the message, I'm going to speak directly to those who are already followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to share with you what I think are four simple things that will help you live in a way when shaking is going on in your life. But for the next few moments, I want to directly address those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ. Those of you who are not yet believers. We know that the world is being shaken the economy, the education, our social life. Everything around us is being shaken. There are fundamental shifts taking place and the things that we thought we could rely on, we can't rely on them anymore. Our health, the economy, our family, all of the things that can be so easily taken from us. So what do we do in those moments of shifting? I think Jesus has some very important words for us to say, and I'm going to read them to you now, but don't worry, they'll come on screen for you as well. In Mark chapter 8, this is what Jesus said. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose their own soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I think that speaks very clearly about a divine disruption that God wants to bring into our life. Some Bibles have a heading and it's called the way of the cross. That's a disruption God may want to bring in your life. Where you have to put him in the driver's seat. Where you have to go the way of the cross. You have to deny the fact that you're living life your own way. And begin to turn around and begin to follow him. Begin to live your life for him. Maybe you're trying to amass some comfort and some security in your life by material possessions and other things. Jesus very clearly disrupts that when he says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? You can have everything that this world has to offer. But as my mother used to say, you cannot take it with you. Jesus comes back and gives us that eternal perspective and says there's something far more important than living for this life in this life. What will a man profit if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Because we have a part of us that will live on eternally. God has planted the seed of eternity in our hearts. We were made to be in relationship with him and in this life He gives us a choice. He gives us a choice to follow him, to take that narrow road, to take that path that will lead to eternal life. He says we have to do that because we won't won't have the chance in the next life. We have to make a decision to follow him. For some of you, that's encouraging news because you want to do that or maybe you've already done it. For others of you, that's really challenging you because it's very uncomfortable. You're going to have to make a decision in this life. And that may mean you denying yourself. It may deny some comforts. It may mean denying you going and leading your own life. Jesus challenges you. For others, you're right in that in-between You you want this life. You, you, You know there's some truth in it. You know the challenge. I want to speak particularly for a moment to men. As men, we're designed to live with a mission. We're designed to live with a mandate on our life that gives us that challenge, that gives us that purpose, that gives us that meaning. 
There is no greater mission. There's no greater mandate. There's no greater calling on your life, man, than living for the kingdom of God, than living for the purpose of God. What on earth are you here for? To live for the kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. It is eternal. And for all of you today, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this message. I, I said I preach for transformation, not in for information. We're designed to follow God. And I want to give you an opportunity to embrace Jesus as your personal risen Savior. And the way to do that is through prayer. Now praying doesn't make you a Christian. Prayer is a gateway to heaven. Prayer is that opportunity for you to say, do you know what? I'm transferring all my trust from myself, from my materialism, from my possessions, from all of the things I've trusted in, and I'm putting my trust in Jesus. I'm going to believe that he came, that he died for me, that he rose again, that one day he's coming back. I'm transferring all my trust in my him. I'm going to receive his forgiveness. You're leaving your atheism behind. You're leaving your agnosticism behind. Maybe even your antagonism behind. Maybe today, as I've been speaking to you, a, a light bulb has come on. Maybe you realize you need to do this. Maybe you realize this is the decision you have to make and you're ready to make it. In a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to lead you in a prayer that will also come on your screen that will give you that opportunity to take that step of faith in following him, to enter that community in faith, to embrace Jesus for yourself. If you're ready to do that, then why don't you say this prayer? You can say it silently in your heart if you're in a place where you don't want to be heard. But if you can Say it out loud. Here's the prayer. Dear God, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn away from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the Savior of the world who died on the cross for me. Bring me your forgiveness your love and your power to transform me. Come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Help me to follow you in everything that I do. Thank you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, or maybe you prayed it many years ago and you, you haven't been walking with God, We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help with you. We'd, we'd love to connect with you. In a few moments, all our contact details will, will come on screen. You can contact us through social media, through the website, through email. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to give you some resources and, and point you in the right direction in your next step. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. What are you afraid of? Is it the uncertainty? The desperation? Hopelessness? Is it fear itself? An ancient book once said, perfect love drives out fear. What greater love is there than a loving God reaching out to us in our pain, in our brokenness, in our dread? It's time to leave the fear behind. It's time to choose Jesus.